course, that, that is how it works. And you can submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. And we got a bucket load of great questions this week, Jim. <laughs> you, you said that with all the conviction of a used car salesman when he's just seen oil blow out the tailpipe. We got the greatest questions in the history of questions this week here on the show. It, wait a now you're Nick Goulas. It, <laughs> that's the, when, no, the, the first local promos, see, that, that when I was a kid that I grew up watching on the, the local Louisville show, we, we even when we got the Memphis show or we got one of Nick Goulas' shows from like Chattanooga or Birmingham, wherever, always the local promos were done by Nick himself because in, back in those days, Except for the live stuff they did on Channel 5 on Saturday morning for Memphis, all of the local promos for all the towns uh, that they had TV in were done in Nashville on like a Wednesday morning or something at, at like Channel 2, I believe. Uh, Mike Shields and Scott Teal and those guys would know more about it. but And Nick would host them by popular demand of himself because he was the boss, because he was the worst television personality in the history of broadcasting, and he had that thick – Greek accent and his hair, it, 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 it was like it, Earl Scheib did Nick Goulas's hair. It was black, jet black and brushed straight back with as much brill cream or whatever the fuck that you could possibly put it where it, under the TV lights, you could almost see bubbles starting to form. He had so much hair grease in his hair and he would start every promo week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. In the exact same way I can still do it. I haven't heard it since 1975 or six or whatever, but I can still do it. Louisville wrestling fans, Tuesday night, you store for one of the biggest cards I've signed in many years. Headlined by that return grudge NWA Southern junior heavyweight championship match, pitting the challenger, the fabulous Jackie Fargo against a man who defeated him last week. Jared King Lawler, the Southern junior heavyweight champion with his manager, Sam Bass. It's going to be a record-breaking crowd, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to sell more tickets than we've ever sold before. So it's an all-time record-breaking crowd expected for Tuesday night at the Louisville Gardens. Get your tickets in advance Monday and Tuesday at the box office all day and at bell time. We'll see you there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be the biggest card that I've ever signed in many months and weeks. <laughs> and by the time he got to the fucking talent, they had like 30 seconds to say. And then he would go... And in the studio of me right now, I got none other than the fabulous Jackie Fargo. Jackie, tell these fans exactly what happened down there last Tuesday night when Sam Bass, Jerry Lawler's manager, hit you over the head with his cowboy boot and busted you open, and and he <laughs> defeated you for that. And then he proceeded to tell exactly what happened, and then you know, and then Fargo would fire up. But this was everywhere, so it was it was. It, you know, you you got the uh, the the idea of the old forties and fifties style wrestling promotion biggest card i've signed in many months and weeks all time record breaking crowd everything was huge because he'd been doing it for that long he'd been doing it for 40 fucking years and you, know, you sound something like that just now well let me say i have a lot of friends who are from the south i have a lot of people i know who have southern accents but nick Goulas, and especially george Goulas too it's almost like they were born without tongues and then had to be taught backwards <laughs> how to speak it's such a bizarre way of speaking from the limited audio I've heard of both of them. Yeah, well, and George, George had a little bit, you know, George kind of talked like that, you know. Um, but he <laughs> gets a little bit of it, you know, but, but Nick, well, because he was Greek. And, you know, when you see like the, I think he was like his parents may have actually been born in Greece or whatever. It was, you know, it was like, so, and he was by, by God, he'd be a, over a hundred now if he was still alive. So that was part of it. And then living in Tennessee, he was from Alabama originally though. And then living in Tennessee in the South, he was a Southern Greek and couldn't talk. Uh, the, the, the great blooper of uh, in, in the history of Madisonville, Kentucky wrestling was Nick was running down the card on the local promo before he would go to the talent and at the spot show in Madisonville, Kentucky, the main event was a nine man blindfold battle Royal as where all the guys put the hood over their head and they can't see. And it's a battle Royal and the last guys, a nine man blindfold battle Royal. I have the audio tape around here somewhere where he said, and the main event, it's going to be a nine bland manifold, nine bland manifold, nine bland, nine men blindfolded, <laughs> nine men blindfolded wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, but but it was it was part of the charm because back uh, wrestling announcers and promoters, uh, uh, Bob Luce, he was Nick Goulas was Nashville's answer to Bob Luce because Bob Luce was as equally insane and 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 a, and a great car wreck television personality in Chicago. And if you ever got the the Bob Luce wrestling classics, and I'm sure some of them got to be on YouTube, but he did a like a six VHS tape set release, which I have and have for many years. And they had a local show in Chicago, Bob Luce's wrestling classics, and he would voice over everything. Ah, it's going to be blood and violence. Oh, look at that bruiser. <laughs> that bruiser. He's going to bust him open. It's going to be blood for our ah, blood's flowing like wine with the crusher. And it was a Chicago amphitheater. Ladies and gentlemen, back then were the days Crusher trained on beer and polka and lifted big fat women. And there he's got Stevens. And it was just, it was fucking insane. Blood feast where, you know, he would, he would put his programs together at Loosewood, those Chicago international amphitheater programs, those big fold out poster size things. I'm sure you've got some or seen yeah. some. And he would just clip out words out of magazines. It was put together like a fucking ransom note. <laughs> Blood feast. <laughs> you know, and under uh, there'd be a picture of Baron Von Raschke doing the claw with that ugly face. And, and he one word would be sick. The other in different typeset would be killer. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever see those commercials he did with like Bobo Brazil? Where he's like, we're here to tell you about crown lookers. Tell them Bobo. <laughs> <laughs> he, and, and he was such a, a, a personality in those days in Chicago uh, that, that he did commercials for people. Ah, hey, it's Bob Luce here. And, you know, and he'd get Moose Cholak. Have I met him in Moose? He looks like a Volkswagen. And it, so, you know, but that was expected back then of that gave the local wrestling promotions their flavor. The opposite of Nicholas in style and really in everything, in every way, but still the same ability to talk through an entire local promo and barely leave any time for the wrestlers is one of my favorites. And that's Reese or Bowden. Yes. In South. I love Reese yes. or Bowden. Well, I'm glad you did. No. <laughs> no, he was a very nice man, but he was, oh my God, it was exciting as watching Stink lose its shit. It, to watch Reeser or listen to Reeser, he had the monotone voice. He was very centurion and old time. And in the fifties, he was great for radio, right? And I'm sure he was on radio in the fifties. And I think he was a a staff announcer at at Channel Three in Shreveport when they started doing TV at Mid South TV at the Irish McNeil Boys Club there, and they do the promos. We did promos every Wednesday. No matter where we were on Tuesday night over in Mississippi where, or where we were, the, I remember leaving six hours of promos and driving 280 miles to go to a show in Mississippi and then still had to go four hours home from the show. Um, but it, it, he was still there when I first got there, and it was just – he was he was almost like an undertaker. You know, he had a nice suit on, and he was all, you know, groomed and everything, but he almost didn't move. And he had the voice that just talked like this <laughs> in the same tone. And and if, if people have seen that blooper, because it made a couple of the um, the national, you know, like funniest videos shows. Oh, that's right. Where Scott Irwin, Super Destroyer, was fucking ran and raving on a promo. And there was Reeser just sitting there on his stool behind his podium with the microphone <laughs> held. You know, and there's this giant Viking looking motherfucker screaming and yelling. And well, he had the mask on at the time. So a, gi a giant masked motherfucker screaming and yelling. And he's Bowden is just inflappable until Super D kicks the fucking podium in disgust and the podium bumps the fucking stool and the stool flies out from <laughs> under Reeser and he drops out of sight. Whom bad and oh good lord, you know, type of thing. And but, and he and he would ring announce uh, a, a lot of times he'd ring announce in uh, the TV matches also, but it just seems Good Lordy. I've never seen a human being. A, a Mark Lorenz looked like a histrionic Jackie Mason type next to Reeser Bowden. No, no. Well, see, Reeser looked bemused by the whole thing. Like every time you see Reeser, it's almost like I was asked to do this this week, so I'm here. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and there's something I get a kick out of. Mark Lorenz, it's like a funeral director. Well, I think actually, well, yeah. <laughs> I 
believe he did have something to do with that line. What was it actually that Mark did? He did something very straight laced. I think he was a preacher too, possibly, or, or a pastor, minister or something. Yeah, pastor. Something. Um Mark Lorenz, the first time we do Fort Worth TV, when we went to world class, right? He's wearing this suit and he you know, I walk up and say, Look, you look like you just stepped off top of a wedding cake and blah, blah, blah. And I tell everybody how great we are. And and he just and I like Mark. He was a nice guy, but once again, he was not an overly uh, demonstrative or inflective. Per he was at monotone, kind of unflappable, and he just kind of took it away dryly. Well, that will happen, folks, at the Tarrant County. And I pull a dollar bill out <laughs> as I'm going to walk off, just to be an asshole. I go, I say, "Hey, why don't you gain some weight?" And I go to stick the dollar bill in his coat pocket. He's never goddamn, uh, you know, when you buy a men's suit jacket, all the pockets are sewn together, right? Yeah. He's never opened up any of his pockets. <laughs> all his pockets were still sewed together on his fucking thing. He really did look like he just stepped off the top of a wedding cake. I said, ah, oh, I'm here, and I slapped it. I put it in his hand. <laughs> oh, my God. We've talked he- about it on the Super Podcast. Uh, my favorite, and I think now many people's favorite, although we can't find the video, uh, my favorite Mark Lorenz moment in the ring is the winner of the match. Kevin, that's it. That's all I said. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, world class. Like when you watch Raw, and you've been a part of major productions, usually there's the countdown, the going on air. You get the fans screaming and yelling. You watch those old world class shows. It starts with like everyone just kind of like walking to their seats or sitting down yes. already. There's like a still. It's like we're here in Dallas, Texas. It's like very calm before all the kids try to rape the Von Erics. Yeah, you know, and. It- I understand what they were doing and they were still treating it like such a sport because when you, when a boxing show came on the air, the people weren't yelling and screaming if the ring was empty, right? Especially in those days, 80s ESPN boxing. Um, but what I always <clears throat> tried to do or like to do was open up the show with the talent coming to the ring or very – very shortly in other words open up and get the people up hey we're cheering and yelling and there's the announcers talking over it and maybe you do a 20 or 30 second stand up but here's the music segues and here comes the talent to the ring and get them into the show early a lot of times in those days they'd sit on the announcers for a couple of minutes at the start while they would tell us what was going to go on on the show that day and it, it, as the as television changed i always like to start in a little bit hotter but um i at the same time Sometimes I used to cheat when we had the small crowds for some Smoky Mountain wrestling tapings up in the hills. I would get them to cheer, stand up and yell and scream for like 45 seconds or a minute at the start of the night. And every, we'd get everybody on camera. And then I'd do my own opens <laughs> from, or have the, the editor put together opens for four shows just out of that. Where the people are yelling and screaming <laughs> and here comes the talent and whatever the fuck. So there's different ways you can do it. Or Nick Goulas or Bob Luce could have been there stirring the people up, and and that would have helped. My first exposure to Mid-South was actually on the Midnight Express, the early years VHS set that you did in 1991 <laughs> or 92. I forget when. And well, I didn't do it, but we'll tell that story in a second and keep going. But, you know, that was my first exposure. It was all the stuff that you put together, and it was great because – at an early age, I also got to see Condry and uh, and David Schultz, like that video from Memphis. I got to see all – you put, like, so much cool footage on there. And then you had, like, an extensive Mid-South – I mean, you had everything. It was incredible. But I, as a kid, I'm like, who's this guy, Greaser? And then, you know, I didn't know yeah, – I don't know Greaser who, Bell. I didn't know who Boyd Pierce was. I thought, like, they're calling him Boy. Who's Boy Pierce and Greaser? <laughs> and it was, like, nothing else I'd ever seen or names I had never heard before. <laughs> 